Okay, um, so let's start. Um, hi everyone, uh, today I wanted to bring you a talk that may be a bit technical, but uh, it's I think a cool experience that I had uh, and some things that I learned along the way. And what I want to talk about today is uh, uh, memory usage in web application. And uh, I want to start with a bit of a bold claim by saying that your web application is right now taking up too much RAM, and we, but we can fix it. What are we talking about then? Like, probably you have seen that recently Cool Chrome uh, added this new feature in which you can uh, uh, hover the tab uh, in your browser and see how much memory is it using. And uh, this like uh, a bit shows uh, what is the cause of uh, uh, the meme of Chrome uh, using a lot of memory in the background. And uh, nobody likes that, and, uh, but there are reasons why uh, Chrome is using so much RAM. And um, like some of that RAM uh, is surely images, uh, uh, text. Uh, some of that RAM instead, it's just memory that is being used by JavaScript. If we look at some websites such as GitHub, they, they're not using too much RAM, like 120 megabytes. Some other websites might be a bit worse. Like uh, I, I saw this page with uh, Airbnb that was using 450 megabytes, which if you think about it, it's a lot. Like, if you have a, a few tabs open, you start having 250 meg 400, 500 megabytes that, that can quickly uh, fill up your space. I was wondering how much of that is actually JavaScript memory and not images and text. Well, if we want to learn that, we can open the um, Chrome uh, profiler, the DevTools, and we can see uh, for each JavaScript virtual machine how much memory is it taking. And for example, here, that page with the Airbnb, uh, it's like 100, 110 megabytes, which is not a lot, but it's not great either. Why does it need 100 megabytes of RAM just to display me a list of places I can go on vacation? And, but if you look uh, hard enough, like you can find some more extreme examples. Like this is me, uh, that I try to load uh, um, pretty big uh, table in Notion, and I found something uh, a bit wild, like it was using 1.5 gigabytes of memory, which if you think about it, it's a lot for displaying a table. And then, uh, like, why am I talking about this? Well, because <laughs> I'm also working on a web app that had those exact kind of problems. I'm working on this tool called Flux, which is a, a web application that allows you to design uh, uh, circuit boards for electronics on the browser. And uh, what we discovered is that the more complicated your document became, the more RAM it was using until it was just too much. And in fact, internally, um, our application is built with uh, web technologies entirely, um, uh, TypeScript, uh, React, uh, WebGL, 3JS. So uh, it uses a lot of cool technologies and uh, to make the 3D rendering possible. And we want to be able to support very big documents with like a lot of different shapes and stuff. And so we had to optimize a lot for it. Initially, what we tried to do is that we were trying to make it faster. We were trying to trade memory usage for speed thinking that, yeah, memory is free, uh, like modern computers have 32 gigs of RAM, who cares, just, just cache everything that you can. And this thing actually backfired really hard. In fact, we follow like some articles that uh, everyone on the internet was like uh, saying, yeah, just, just memoize, just cache everything, RAM is free. Is it though? We, we found out that it, it's, it's not really, especially on the web. And um, so, like, you might ask, okay, so what does one gigabyte of RAM, what difference does it make on my computer that has 32, 64 gigs of RAM? Well, there are some reasons. The first reason is that you don't have the 32 gigs of RAM available in your browser. If you try to allocate a very big array uh, in, um, in JavaScript, your uh, browser, Chrome or, or Firefox or Safari, will kill your tab. And the limit, uh, for example, in Chrome is four gigabytes-ish. 
uh, the one in Safari it's even lower, like on some devices it's 300 megabytes. If your website starts using more than that uh, amount of memory, your browser will kill your application and you can't do anything about it. The user will see this, uh, this horrible error and uh, they will have to refresh the page. And this is something that happens. And it's not something that, oh, it, it never happens. Notion, for example, there are people that are complaining that when they loaded big documents or big tables or stuff, the mobile application would, uh, not the um, mobile page would just crash and they're going to our boot loop. And this is unacceptable. Like, uh, um, here we're talking about your app working or your app not working. So that's why we care about memory optimization. Another thing is that uh, we also care about performance. Every time that you use memory in a language uh, that is garbage collected, like JavaScript, uh, then it will need to be cleaned up. And that, that, is, that like, will uh, take time during the execution of application, so it will slow everything down. And this is a pretty extreme example that was like a few minutes of garbage collecting, <laughs> but uh, uh, this is not something that you will see usually. But something that you will see usually is something like this, like uh, um, something that is supposed to run very quickly, but actually was taking half a second because we were allocating a lot of memory and the browser had to clean up if that afterwards. And another reason is that, uh, uh, like, uh, if you look at my browser, you will probably see that I have uh, 25 tabs open, and I have four browser pages open with 25 tabs open. I realize that I'm a bit of a degenerate case and I should start closing stuff, but uh, I don't think I'm the only one. I think that a lot of other people keep tabs open. And uh, if each one of those tabs start occupying one gig of RAM, well, that's going to sum up pretty quickly. And so let you use your multitask. Don't have your web page occupy all the RAM so that the user can't do this anymore. I know it's bad, but you shouldn't be the one that prevents the user from doing that. And uh, so, like, uh, what I had to solve, what I have to do is ask myself, how do we solve this? Well, um, of course, the, the first step is identifying uh, what is occupying so much memory, so that we can figure out how to fix it. Then uh, uh, you need to remove the things that is occupying memory and. Uh, make sure then that uh, we, you don't repeat the same mistake again. Here there is a lot to talk about, so I wanted today to just focus on the, um, the first part. How do we identify what is occupying memory? Well, uh, um, to do that, first I want to uh, introduce uh, a few topics. Um, like some keywords that I use when I talk about memory usage. The first one is what I call static or transient memory usage. And static memory usage is the one that you will see with a heap snapshot, and it's the memory usage that uh, it stays there for a lot of time during the execution of an application. For example, imagine some data that has been loaded stays there, or your, the status of the page, which is a different thing compared to transient memory usage, that is where, for example, you have a peak of memory usage that gets used and then gets deleted immediately. Think about if you press a button and that button triggers a computation that takes a few seconds and then uh, uh, all the, the computation is finished. But uh, um, those things, the transient peaks of memory usage are much harder to catch because uh, uh, the tools that we have, uh, uh, we, we need to use two different kind of tools to find two, two, two different things. We will see them later. Another important difference is the difference between count and size. Because, of course, you can have some uh, objects in memory which are giant, like a 500 megabyte array. And those are pretty easy to catch because like, they will immediately pop up in the, in the memory usage. But you could also have something like uh, um, a lot of small objects, like uh, millions of four byte each objects that can quickly become hundreds of megabytes. And if you have something like that, it's much, much harder to figure out why is that happening. And another important thing is the difference between shallow and retained size. If you look in, into the Chrome developer tools, you will see the difference between those two categories. And they are a bit cryptic. And the, the reason why they are called like that is because uh, uh, JavaScript um, uses pointers. Like, if you have an array of strings, what you really have, it's an array of 
references the string. So um, an array might just have a lot of pointers inside of it, which might take uh, um, very few memory, like 40 bytes. But each one of those pointers is referring to something that is much bigger that needs to be retained in memory. And that's the difference between the two things. And last thing that I wanted to mention is the different allocation types. And that's a thing that you can see in the, uh, in the profiler, that like uh, each type of memory usage behaves in a different way. The, even your code takes up memory. Then you have strings, you have arrays, and by looking into how those things work, you realize a lot of cool things, like that every time that you create a function in JavaScript, that, that can take a lot of memory, because the function itself needs to remember what is the environment that uh, that function is putting. It's the, what is called in jargon the closure. So um, if you look at uh, what are the different allocation types, you will learn uh, uh, what are some things that you should be avoid doing. And um, so now that we have a f like a bit of lexicon to discuss those things, I wanted to uh, talk about tooling. What are some open source tools that you can use uh, to uh, analyze memory usage? Well, the first of all is, of course, the memory profiler. Uh, if you do right click, inspect element in Chrome, you will op the, open the developer tools. And one of those tabs is memory. And memory is very cool because it allows you to um, analyze what is the memory usage by using heap snapshot and the allocation sampling. Those are the, the one that I use the most. Heap snapshot means that uh, it pauses your application and it records, it saves everything that is in RAM at that moment. And uh, it will then show it to you uh, divided by the object type. And that is very useful because uh, it allows you to see what is the static memory usage. Like suppose that you have something that is staying there in your app and is taking hundreds of megabytes. With that, you can quickly identify it. You can sort it by written size and then check what are the heaviest ones. If you want to analyze transient peak of memory usage instead, you can use the allocation sampling, which uh, is another tool that uh, records every time that uh, new memory is allocated. What it means is that uh, uh, you are not getting what is the final memory usage because you're just getting when stuff is being created, no, not when it's being deleted. But this is very useful because with that you can see peaks of memory and what, which ones are the function that cause that. Um, so yeah, those are two different modes, two different tools that are useful for analyzing two very different kind of problems. And so let's, let's play a bit with the memory profiler. For example, here, um, in this example, I analyze the memory usage of the um, application that I'm working on, Flux. And uh, I press record to um, take a snapshot. And then uh, um, when it loaded, I'm able to click on it. Uh-huh. 358 megabytes, yet yeah, that's quite a lot. I'm able to click on it, and I can see for each type what is the, um, the size that is occupying. We can sort it by written size. And I saw that there were some maps that were taking 90 megabytes of RAM. That's a bit of a lot of memory. So I opened it, and by looking at it, I was able to check that there was one specific one that was giant. So I had some objects that were created that were way bigger than the others. And by looking at the tab below, I'm also able to check uh, which function created that one. And that's a very cool discovery, because like, I discovered that there was this giant object that was taking a lot of memory. And uh, by looking at it, by looking at the code, I found out that uh, uh, we had something that was not optimized well. We were calling thousands of times uh, a function that was creating a string. And um, basically what we did uh, is uh, instead of using strings, we started uh, using a set, uh, which is a much more efficient data structure. And by using that, we were able to like, uh, uh, cut the memory usage in half, which is, this is like an example of something that is glaringly obvious, a problem, a problem that you have to solve, like some, something giant in your application. 
and once we solve that, uh, uh, we saved uh, a lot of memory. But uh, that was the only one that we found, pretty much. Because then uh, uh, the remaining problem was that we had like 200 megabytes of objects. And we, we didn't have like a giant object that were like, was like, yeah, that, that's the problem. Do we have to optimize that thing? But rather we had uh, um, 2,256,000 628 objects that were a few bytes each. And we, we, we couldn't just like um, look at uh, um, what was inside of it uh, one by one, because that, that's too many. And so we had to go on a different route. And if you look at the example that I was talking about before with Notion, it's exactly the same thing. You have uh, 7 million objects uh, with, that occupy 400 megabytes. So that, that's a bit of a common thing, actually. And how do we go to analyze that? Well, thankfully, you can do right-click save. And uh, it saves a giant JSON file that then you can uh, analyze. And, uh, but the format is complicated. So let's talk about a new tool, MemLab. Um, this is an amazing tool, open source, by uh, Meta that uh, they are using for analyzing the performance of Facebook uh, and Instagram. And what it does uh, is that it provides a giant uh, set of utilities to uh, check memory usage. For example, it can run uh, in your CI pipeline and constantly profile your uh, website and check how much memory it's using. It can also um, check for memory leaks. Uh, and also it provides uh, um, a powerful API for loading snapshots which means that uh, if you take a memory snapshot, you can save it, and you can load it here, and you can uh, use those utility functions to check what's inside of it. So we, uh, by using this tool, uh, we try to answer a question. Out of those millions of objects that we have, which ones are the one that, uh, like, w what type of objects, where, where are they coming from? Who is creating that many objects? So we use the tooling uh, from MemLab to write this, uh, um, this code here. That uh, It's a bit of a lot of code, but uh, uh, I try to annotate it a bit. What it does is that it loads the snapshot, uh, the one that we saved from the uh, Chrome uh, uh, DevTools. It finds what are the types of the objects, and it computes the total shallow size for each one, clusters them together. And then it sorts the result by big and biggest one first, and it prints it out. And what we found with this was very interesting. Like with this, we had a list of uh, each object type, and for each object type, uh, which one uh, was the one that was taking the most memory. And when we look at the top one, we saw that's not ours. There was nothing in our application that uh, um, had that specific uh, type of objects. So uh, we looked a bit more into it, and we found out that it was actually, actually React. That's uh, an internal data structure that is used by React uh, to uh, keep track of uh, the state of your application. So with, with this, we, we learned that uh, the way that we were using React was uh, wrong, and that uh, we were doing something very inefficient there. And um, so we had to go a bit deeper. And we wanted to um, check which React components were the ones that were causing that problem. So we wrote another analyzer, this time even more complicated, that looked uh, inside the uh, React data structures. And uh, by looking inside the React data structure, we was able to check for each type of uh, component uh, which one was the, the one that was using a lot of memory. And uh, by clustering the results together again, uh, we were able to find uh, a bunch of components that were using a lot of RAM. And uh, why, when we optimized those, we also gained a lot of like 50% like memory improvement over the 51, the 50 that we got before. Uh, so that was cool. And so we learned that basically, if you have a situation like that in which you have a, a lot of objects, um, the only thing that you can do is export it uh, and try to analyze with like, an external tool, unfortunately. But actually, with MemLab, it turned out to be pretty easy. So that's cool. 
And we were also able to use that to answer other questions. Like, uh, we were using strings to represent ID of things. And we asked ourselves, how much memory will we save if we use numbers instead of strings? And because like everyone was talking about, oh yeah, we have to do that, that's that big refactor. And I was like, wait, does it actually make sense? And try, trying to compute it, and I calculated that we will save like uh, three megabytes. So <laughs> that was the definitive answer that it, it was not worth it. And uh, the way that I did is by analyzing every string that it was in memory. And I just checked uh, with uh, regex if it was a new idea or not. And then I uh, compare uh, how, m how many of those were actually UIDs. So that's another cool thing that you can do with MemLab. So just to sum up, um, memory analysis is difficult, and uh, it's a lot magic. A lot of magic because browsers do a lot of weird things under the hood. And, uh, but it's worth it. Like For some application, uh, it, it really makes a difference between your application working and your application just crashing. So sometimes it's not something that is just uh, uh, sunk in cost, but uh, it's something that is very useful for your user if you care about performance. And the last thing is that sometimes the, the, the COM profiler, uh, it's very, very cool, and there's a lot of, diff um, of useful things that you, could, that you can do. But sometimes you need to go a bit the extra mile and uh, uh, use some tools like MemLab. And yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Here's a question. I can also repeat it, but let's wait for a moment. Yeah, and let's start with this, please. Uh, hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, we have an application which uses a pool of web workers. How does the Chrome profiler and or MemLab deal with web workers? Can you isolate one and then profile it, or how do you do it? I have the answer for you here. If you look at the, uh, how I showed the, um, the memory profiler, you see that you can select the JavaScript virtual machine instance. The thing is that every web worker that you have will generate uh, a new virtual machine instance. And with that one, uh, if you can click on uh, one of the virtual machines, and you can select which specific web worker you want to analyze. Or I believe that if you don't select anything, it will just analyze all of them at once. But now that you tell me, if you have a bunch of web workers, I'm a f I don't think you can multi-select them. Uh, like, probably you need to do them one by one, which sucks, but yeah. Any experience you have compared to the Firefox DevTools? Yeah. Um, the thing is that uh, with the Firefox DevTools, uh, um, I always want to use them just that the, our app runs a bit slower on Firefox, so we never try to profile it there because uh, uh, we were always like, yeah, Chrome is the reference here, unfortunately, because it means that Chrome is becoming the Internet Explorer 6 of web. And, uh, but the tools on Firefox are also great. The thing is that uh, when you reach high memory usage, the Chrome profiler is much more stable because the, like, the profiler itself is a web page. So if you start having a web page that's to analyze another web page, it means that the other web page must be more powerful than the one that you are analyzing. So um, the one that the Firefox has, it's a bit more heavy, it's a bit less optimized, so it, it just crashed more often, and I, I, I unfortunately eventually gave up. And like I did this exact same talk as, at FOSDEM uh, a few months ago, and there were the guys from the Firefox team that were like, yeah, try the Firefox profile, and I still have to find the time to do it, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, if I may, and a second question. The tools you developed using MemLab, can we, can we also use them? Are they available somewhere? Uh, yeah, I still have to publish them on GitHub, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I will publish them when I polish them up a bit, but if you want, I can just send the code to you. Looks very useful. Thank you. Thank you.
That's all. Thank you.